What is going on out there, everybody? And thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And as always, the man sitting beside me, the myth, the legend, mi amigo, Cal Filio Filson. How's it going, everybody? Yeah, man, it feels good to get back <laughs> in studio. It's been a wild uh, couple of weeks. Oh. Uh, starting off, number one, you had a birthday. Oh, yep. I had a Thanksgiving Day was my birthday. So that was... November 26th was your birthday. Yep. My son, Luke, my youngest, you're all familiar with him. His birthday was November 24th. So we had... Uh, well, see, because his birthday sometimes falls on Thanksgiving, and even if it doesn't, it's really close to Thanksgiving, you can't really have his birthday party because almost nobody attends because they're yeah. all doing stuff yeah. with family. So normally what we do is we'll go take Luke to like his favorite restaurant. We'll kind of do like a family thing, and then we'll have the party a couple weeks later. So that's exactly what we did this time. So on his actual birthday, we took him to this uh, Japanese steakhouse. He likes chicken teriyaki. He likes to – it's like a hibachi. You know, like what's uh, Benny Hanna's and stuff where they cook in front of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he loves that stuff because, you know, the guy does the trick with the onion volcano and the little guy that urinates on it and throws the eggs and, you know, lands in their For hat. people that don't know, what he means by urinating is there's like a little plastic guy and they want to yeah. put the fire out. Y'all know that you've been there and they it's, pull the little pants down and water comes out of the little, yeah. Yeah. It's I, not I, like a dude's real, a chef's not really urinating on his burning onions. Although... <laughs> No, I mean, Luke loves that stuff. I mean, yeah. I'm, 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 I'll be honest. I like it, too. But, uh, yeah, so that's what we did. We went there and did that. And then what else did we do? Hey, you got to open up all his gifts. And, of course, his gifts are mostly like, you know, alien toys or uh, Terminator toys, some gremlins he got, and then a bunch of other stuff. He's been actually getting into making stop-motion films. So kind of like the old Gumby yep. films for you uh, millennials that don't know what Gumby is. Back in the day, they said, like, mold clay, and they'd take a picture mold it, move it a little bit, take another picture, and then they would sequence them all together. Well, they actually have an app now for an iPad or the Kindle, and uh, they also make another camera, an aftermarket camera. He doesn't know he's getting that for Christmas yet. Oh, he's going to go crazy. But uh, yeah, and he strings them all together, and then it allows you to uh, access sound effects, but he's already figured out a way to use my phone, go on YouTube, record sound effects, and then add them to a stop-motion films. That's hilarious. You, he showed you a couple of them. I have bared over. witness to multiple stop motion films They're pretty recently. Good. Yeah. So he got a bunch of, imagine, the only thing I could we could think of was um, he wants to build like little sets so he can use his Godzilla and kaiju toys to destroy the city. So my wife, you know, was looking in the toy section. Of course, there's nothing like that. But I was like, you need to go to like model train sets because those guys that are in the model trains, mm -hmm. remember when I was a kid, we used to return the, our billiards table or pool table into an actual train set. So, you know, you can buy the miniature trees, the miniature buildings for any kind of building you can think of. And then Godzilla can wreck them. Right. So we bought him a bunch of that stuff. Um, so he can use that in his stop motion films. And then on December 5th, we actually had his party where all his friends could come to like this place called urban air. It's like a indoor. It's got like trampolines everywhere. It's got like uh foam pits, dodgeball, zip lining. I mean, just, Crazy stuff where you climb up the cliff wall. So he's up there like Alex Honnold, you know, with a, but, uh, with a harness on, of course. Yeah. We did all that. And then um, you had your birthday. Yeah. Yep. On Thanksgiving Day. And then your mother-in-law fell. Oh, uh, I've got. Uh, yeah. So I'll get in. Yeah. Okay. So right. I'm going to take it over now and we're going to get into what's been going down. So again, everybody gets busy. This is where we've been, is busy. We've had a lot going down. For those that don't know, about six years ago, my mother-in-law had a an accident uh, where she fell uh, and suffered a very severe head injury. Uh, she's in her 60s at the time. What she was doing was being basically a very independent woman. She was outside cleaning her windows on a step stool. And this is back when this first happened. She slipped off the step stool, fell probably eight foot onto the back on flat of her back and hit her head on the paver stones in her backyard. And we have no idea how long she was there. She lives independently and down from us. I mean, we don't, you know, and we have no idea how long she was down and we went and checked on her because, you know, my, my wife and my sister-in-law and all, they talk to her every day, you know, they talk to their mother. And of course this all goes on anyway, ends up all this bad stuff. And it's kind of, it's led to some real trouble. And as of recently, she started suffering some more problems mentally. And we were afraid of dementia. 
is what it was. So we've taken her and had her do all these tests with the neurologist. And actually, that's what is it's progressing towards at this moment. Oh, they know that now? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, and so, but they were having what's called a brain seizure. And during this time, she was going to the neurologist. She was doing what, like EEGs, CAT scans. They were doing everything, trying to figure out what this problem was. Because when they would do these tests on her, she was passing all of them. But yet, what she had going on was not working like you could just tell there was a huge problem. And did they check for possible stroke? Yes, they checked her for, yeah, they've ran her through the ringer. And I mean, she's like hallucinating. She's seeing people. It's not there. Talking to people. It's not there. Uh, you know, we were worried not only about her safety. We were like, okay, you know, now we got to do something. Well, during this time, we got her into a, a little bit of a rehab facility after she'd gone to the doctor. So she could, uh, they were going to put her on a type of medication that was supposed to help with these, these brain problems. And kind of see how she was going to work it all out. Well, while she was in that facility, somehow she ended up falling uh, unattended and broke her hip. Mm. So, And that's bad. It's real bad. So she's broken her hip. She's uh, She just recently had knee surgery like a month or so ago, two months ago. And then this stuff started spiraling. All this is down. So we have done with hospital, rehab, hospital. You can't go see her in the rehab facilities, but you can visit her in the hospital. We're dealing with all of that stuff going on. We're dealing with also the onset of what is going to end up happening with the dementia. Uh, during all of this, my mother had to have a hip surgery, hip replacement. You know, mind you, she's had a couple already uh, on one side. Yeah, because there was a time where she lived with you. Yeah, for eight weeks she for lived weeks with me. Lived yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was was really awesome time. Not at all. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so she's going through that. So she's in a rehab facility now. Now, during all that time of dealing with this the last several weeks, uh, on Thanksgiving Day, I found out I'm going to be a grandfather. All right. That's right. Congratulations. I'm going to be a Paul. I'm going to be Grumps. That's what I'm going to go by now. Grumps. Is Grumps? That is a fitting name. <laughs> yeah, I knew you was going to say really that. It really is. That's a great yeah. for you. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's what it's going to be. And I quit my job, folks. Right? Now, uh, that was a shocker. That was a shocker that I threw it out of left field at everybody. Uh, started talking to my wife, and my wife was pretty much demanding on the fact that she wanted me to be happy and knew that I wasn't. And so we looked at the numbers, worked everything out, and I turned in. And I left my job of almost 17 years to basically pursue not just podcasting, but some videography and photography and drone work and all that stuff on the side. So... This is what I'm doing now, players. Congratulations. You Thanks, actually, man. of the two of us, you're the full-time podcast. That's it. That's what I'm doing now. So where we have been this whole time, and we really appreciate the emails, yeah, the absolutely. messages, the whole thing, all the love y'all sent us. Where we have been is five weeks of life and a beating, and it's been it's been stressful. It's been stressful for my whole family, for us going through it. So that little light at the end of the tunnel now to know we get to sit down, him and I get to go through and talk to y'all and do all this. We get to have it on YouTube. We That's get right. to have it in the podcast. All of these things, it's coming together. I have all kinds of stuff coming up now for the shows, for more videos, extra videos. I'm excited. Dude, it's fixing to get crazy because like I said, now I got time to play in here. So this is what I'll be doing. This is where we've been. And all right, enough of the flapping of our stops. Yep. Let's go ahead and jump into some stories. Let's get what y'all came here for. Let's get into the news. Check this out. A private at a Great Lakes Naval Station, Naval Air Station, I'm assuming, reports that he and some other recruits have recently experiencing what they called full body apparitions and shadow figures in different areas at this base. I always when you anytime I hear the word full body apparition, I think of Ghostbusters. That's what I think of. Remember over in, in the, the library. library? Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Uh, it says, I'm keeping my name, rank, and job private and using a throwaway account for the sake of anonymity. I should also mention the military is very big on information being leaked to the public, so I'm not going to release any information that I'm not allowed to release. Well, thank you for that. Any op opinions I have are my own and only my own. I will disclose that I am in the USN and the base in question is Great Lakes, Illinois. I just graduated from boot camp, and while I was there, some strange things happened to me and some other recruits that could not be explained, and I'd like some answers. Here's the story. When you are in boot camp, you have to stand watch occasionally for a few hours. I was usually put on watch at night. Me and my partner usually stood watch from around midnight to around 2 a.m. My job was usually roving security, 
which is basically the person who patrols a set area and takes temperature readings and looks for suspicious activity, etc. Usually, the most serious things I dealt with were other recruits messing around in the bathrooms and I had to tell them to go back to their bunks. One night, around two in the morning, I was making my normal rounds and I thought I heard some talking coming from the bathroom. Or the head, they call it in the Navy, right? True, true. I went inside and I heard whispering coming from one of the showers. So I walked towards them. And what I saw was just weird. Whoa, whoa, saw, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. I saw a young man, around 17 to 20 years old, hunched over, facing away from me in the darkest corner of the shower area. I walked towards him and said, Hey, man, I need you to get back to your bunk. And as I was approaching him, I swear, he vanished in the thin air. In the blink of an eye, I remember the feeling of pure shock and confusion. Now, when I'm reading this, you're supposed to be acting this out. Oh, yeah. Special expressions, okay? When I walked out, the the other guy on watch asked me- The other guy. (laughs) Why I was so pale. And I, of course, told him what just happened. I told him exactly what I had seen, and he said it was most likely a result of me being tired and from all the stress of boot camp and the lack of sleep. I agreed with him, and because I figured- Why would a ghost haunt a shower at boot camp of all places? And I was pretty tired that night. The next night, I did not have to do watch, but the recruit who had my usual shift reported seeing a shadow in the corners and some weird whispering noises while there was nobody there. I talked to him and told him what I had seen and that it was most likely our minds just playing tricks on us because we were all tired. He agreed and we decided that we should just ignore it. That was... Until, Cam, I started seeing things outside of the showers. Oh, great. I had a slightly earlier watch this night and was out patrolling the bunks, checking on recruits who were sick, as I'm supposed to. I was walking past some empty bunks and saw some movement in the corner of my eye. I figured it was some recruit messing around, so I went to tell them to go back to bed. But as I approached the empty bunks, I saw some kind of shadowy figure that did not look humanoid at all to me. It was like a black blob just moving around. When I investigated it, it vanished. The area it was in was extremely cold compared to the rest of the room. I just walked away, and there was nothing to do there, and figured that the staff must have cranked the air conditioning, and I was just tired of, and my mind was making stuff up. I saw this out of the corner of my eye, and throughout boot camp while in the early on one early morning watch. Now, the last story for me was when I was tasked with taking temperatures throughout the whole building. My job was to go to each division's compartment and ask for their room temperature. I had just taken all but two other division temperatures and was looking for the last two. Now, I wonder why they're checking the temperature. That's and, just what I was thinking. I mean, it's like, is it like, I remember my dad was always mad about it. somebody's messing with the thermostat, you know, because he's trying to save yeah. 35 cents or whatever it was. <laughs> yes. I wonder if they just have an overactive drill instructor who just is like, he wants to make it unbearable to him. So he wants to know, hey, wait, they got it too, a little too good, too comfortable in this room. Well, I just wonder if it's one of those things, if the military is anything like my old job was to where you have to prove indefinitely that that's exactly what the problem is. So he's checking all the vents to make sure that like the unit's not, not working oh, yeah, to maybe. its proper order before they replace it. The person says, as I was- walked past some empty rooms, I could have sworn I saw movement inside. So I figured I must be, I must have missed a room and went to look inside their window. The room was just being used as storage and was pitch black except for the light from outside. All I could see were some boxes and empty bunks. But again, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a person standing on the edge of the light facing me. I saw this and decided I was just going to look elsewhere for the last two rooms, which I found a few minutes later, right? Yeah, no joke. (laughs) However, as I was returning... To turn in my readings, I noticed in the hallway a shadowy arm or limb being outstretched and coming back behind a doorway. And when I passed, there was nothing but the area it was in, and that area was super cold, and the room it was just in was just a closed janitorial closet. Now, the other recruit I previously mentioned spoke about seeing somebody dancing in the showers at night, but being nothing when he investigated He also said that one night he passed by the showers and saw someone peek out from around the corner and then disappear behind the wall. When he went to investigate and to get onto him because he thought it was one of the recruits, there was no one there. There was no doors or no place for them to escape. 
So what was it? So ghost is what it sounds like. There's only it can ghost. be. You know, and this is this happens a lot where people see ghosts, but they don't really know they're seeing ghosts. They think it's people. Yeah. I wonder, you know, we've done other stories on the show before. I wonder if you listening or even me or you, Cam, have actually seen a ghost and just wasn't aware that we did because it looked like a person. I, Yeah. I think that could happen like more. Like just in passing, right? Like you just never thought about well, it. Well, we've like, talked about passing like black-eyed kids on the street and not you wouldn't know it unless you looked them dead in the eye. Like really close? I, I'm, I can see. Well, like we've discussed, if you were at a park one evening walking your dog and you saw somebody over there go through what if it was a ghost and you were just like that's just somebody else at the park yeah, right because i'm not a real nosy person so like I, every time somebody walks around me i'm not like really checking them yeah. out like what's this person doing i just kind of mind my business you know mm-hmm. what i mean it's easier and better that way yeah you don't want to be like just gawking but why would people. there be ghosts at like a boot camp i have no idea you know that's a weird place was it traumatic for that spirit in that boot camp area or Maybe. was that like a point of happiness and that's where like maybe they died in the war and this was their happy moment they know they like they were becoming a man (laughs) and you know what i'm saying like boot camp was their favorite you know it's weird because that's not a place that i would think you would want to be haunting you're right because there's places you think of ghosts hanging out right like an old western bar or a cemetery or an old decrepit house or sanitarium then there's other places like at a tractor pull or good point uh, i don't know a skating rink or something Something fun. You just yeah. you never you never think a ghost. An arcade. There. I need to look the into beach. that. We need to. <laughs> we're looking into that. There's got to be some stories of like arcades and, and skating rink ghosts somewhere out there. There has to be. You think? I bet so. Yeah. There's got to be. There's people got ghost stories from everywhere. There has to be some folks. If you've got some from an arcade, <laughs> a skating rink, like yeah, like any food trucks, something crazy. Send them in. Send them in. I got something for you, bro. Okay. This takes place in Cass County, Texas. And for those of you that want to know where Cass County is, if you pay any attention to any of the Bigfoot uh, research and Bigfoot things that go on, let's say like uh, the little get togethers, the little shindigs and symposiums and whatnot in the state of Texas, you'll know of the one in Jefferson, right? You and I've been there. If you go north out of Jefferson a few miles, you'll run into Cass County. Cass County is in the far eastern side of Texas, pretty much northeast. Like it's right on the border. Cass County is of Arkansas. So you go north out of like Marshall to Jefferson, Jefferson up into Cass County. Well, that Marshall area is very dense woods, very thick. It's beautiful. Yeah, really I love it there. But you know what I'm talking about? Like when you, if you were to walk from the road into that woods, visibility is probably 40 yards. Yeah, probably. As thick as it is down through there. Yeah, yeah. So that gives you an idea, y'all an idea of where this comes from. I want you to check this out. goes on to say this. I was driving on a rural road in Cass County, Texas. There was not a lot of traffic that night, so she had her bright lights on. We were passing through a Where's particular- Where's the bright light comment? Yeah, right. Yeah, man. Yeah, I need to hit that. Uh, we were passing through a particularly wooded stretch, woods on both sides, no street lights, so the only thing illum- illuminating the road was her headlights. We came over a slide hill, and there it was, 20 yards ahead. It was massive, very dark in color, and was walking across the road upright on two funny looking legs. I started to slow down and we just watched in shock as it crossed the road in front of our car and ran off into the woods. We drove in silence for a minute trying to process what we had just seen. As we started to talk about it, we realized that we had both seen it, gave similar descriptions of it, that there was no way it was human or bear like, and both saw a more dog like rather than ape like creature. We are both completely creeped out by the whole thing. The legs were bizarre, long and skinny, but bent backwards. That's a man that's always described. Yeah. Goes on to say, if that makes sense. Well, of course it makes sense. That's dog man. It appeared to be covered in black fur and we could see a long snout, which made us think dog could not make out ears or eyes. It never looked directly at us. So it was a profile view that we saw. Now, it literally looked like a giant wolf walking on its hind legs across the highway. If I had to guess, it must have been seven and a half to eight feet oh, tall. Geez. Why is they always so tall? It was huge <laughs> and did not appear to be afraid or even acknowledge that our car was headed straight for it. There's another account here. 
This person writes in saying, ST writes, as we were driving home, I noticed something was running alongside the car. This is a different? Different. A different account? Different, a complete encounter in Cass County. Same county. Okay, I'm with you. It was just behind, it says run alongside the car, just behind my window, behind where the edge of the door ends and before where the back window begins. I looked over at the speedometer, 40 miles an hour. I looked at my friend. He was looking straight ahead, but seemed to be scared. I looked straight ahead. I could see it. I could see one huge arm, matted hair, reddish brown. Now it says sticky looking and primal. This occurred in Cass County, Texas. My friend had also seen it and said it was canine, but thought this thing must have been a skinwalker. Yeah. I have no idea what it was. I'll tell you this, Cam. If I'm driving down a road, a lonely road in Texas or anywhere else, and I see what appears to be a large, upright, walking canine. More than 40? You can bet your sweet ass I'm driving more than 40. (laughs) Bumping it up past 40? I drive more than 40 just to go to nothing bunk case. (laughs) That ain't no lie. We hit that up just since since I happen to have time. (laughs) But like, well, you know, what are these people saying? Why is it like... This is a question I've asked before on the show. Is it more sightings or people just feel more comfortable and now coming forward? That's a great point. It's strange to me that more people are looking for them. 20 years ago, I only heard of like one case ever. And now it's like I hear a new one every other week. It's a very, man, it's so strange. It is so strange. Do you think it's a real thing? Flesh and blood? Do you think it's? No, absolutely not. It can't be. It That's cannot a, okay. be a flesh and blood. No, I don't. Creature. I'm with you. I'm with a you. dog man. It cannot be flesh and blood. It can't be like a werewolf because they're always so Wait tall. Wait a second. It can be flesh and blood if it's not of this dimension. Let's put it that way. If you're willing to go out and start talking about eight foot tall wolves walking on back legs and are extremely intelligent, know when you're in the woods. Know when you're looking at it. Uh, can take pistol fire from point blank range basically and shake yep. that off. And it's not, of course, from where we're from. It's not of this plane of any way, but it's not. a. There is no way it's a flesh and blood real creature unless it has been created in the lab and bred oh, and now crossed. We're going deep. Yeah, now we're going that's deep. the only way. That's the only way. It can't be. Talk that talk. There is talk that nothing talk. like that. There's nothing like that well, how in the come, record. I mean, and are always des- described as being so tall. Like, why can a jockey or like a short person? How come they can't become a werewolf? It's they always could. tall people. Yeah. yeah, they could. But that's just like that, though. The wolves are so much bigger, I guess. <laughs> and I don't because know. Because it's, it's, it's not a werewolf. I did get a story. I still believe it's like a demon or something manifesting in the form of something that terrifies you. But why would you pick wolf? Wouldn't it? Look, to me, a bear is a hell of a lot more scarier than a wolf. Oh, like, yeah. I'd be more afraid of a grizzly than a dog man. For some, I, I, just I was just thinking crazy. of that because um, I heard somebody talking about coyotes. And I hear this all the time. Where people are constantly terrified about coyotes, man. They're no joke. They're no joke. I have never been scared of coyotes. I've no. never heard of them hurting anybody. We did have a fella get killed uh, uh, south of us here, I believe, last week uh, from a mountain lion attack in Lipan, Texas. Well, I heard that uh, that's not necessarily true now. I think they've come out with new light, but it does, I don't know. Either way, they don't. They didn't think he was predation. I think that so. Maybe he died out there of heart yeah. attack or something, and they and got him. Yeah, probably. That's probably what happened. Yeah, uh, I'd have to look into that. But but, but I know what you but, mean. But I know about what you're coyotes. saying, like mountain lions, I would be scared. But even saying that, I've I mean, I've never heard of one person that ever being attacked. I have had numerous run-ins with coyotes, and they've always ended in sharp sticks or gunfire. And I've never had one that stuck around for anything. That's what I'm saying. As soon as you they walk see you, they gone. Them, they are booking. And I'm sure there's outliers. There's always outliers. And there's things that are different. But my experiences and your experiences with them, they don't ever hang around. So, I think they're when the people, I mean, because- like But wolves a, are a whole different story. Oh, yeah. yeah wolves are gigantic. And, like, but, and they'll, they'll hunt you. It's a whole different story dealing with a wolf. Yeah. I think um, as far as coyotes go, you're only in danger, like maybe small house pets. Yeah, as if you, you were a cat. As a person, I don't think you'd ever have a problem with them. I don't, at least not around here. I mean, unless there's something, I mean, yeah, I don't know. But I'm with you. How come there's no upright? Now nah, I say that. Up I'm not, walking coyote? I'm not going to get into that because I have received a, sto- a story from an older woman named Grace that's a little bit strange. It's it's along the idea of small wolf coyote-like entities. A coy so, dog. Yeah, kind of like that. A yeah. shape-shifting coy yeah. dog. Well, that is crazy. Well, let's take a break, folks. When we get back from the break, 
We're going to be uh, talking about some interesting listener stories that have been sent to us over the break that we had. So stick around. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. back with expanded perspectives uh yeah we had a rather unusually long break but i'm not gonna lie it was a little nice to be off of the microphone for a couple weeks you know when we've been doing something for seven years uh it just time flies by it uh it becomes kind of mundane so it was nice to have a little break but i'm glad to be back and while we were gone a lot of people kept sending their stories in so we appreciate that if you want to send your stories into me and Cam, please do not hesitate. Go ahead and do that. You can email the show, expandedperspectives at yahoo.com, or you can call the show, 888 393 2783. That's 888 393 2783. And you'll hear your beautiful voice played on our show. Perhaps, I can't promise everybody will get on. We got a lot of people sending their stuff in. But we recently got a pretty interesting story. And uh, I'd like to share it with you and Cam, and I think you're going to like this. Check this out. It says, this all started when I was very young. These odd experiences that I would have. Some were terrifying. Others left me thinking I was losing my mind. And some made me begin to question everything around me. My reality. Our reality as humans. It's taken me a long time to come to terms with what has plagued me, and not just me, but others in my family too. How long will this continue, and is there a way to stop it? My first experience that I can remember started when I was around eight years old. I'm 52 years old now, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about my situation at least once a day. I'm a second generation American, my grandparents, on my mother's side, were Hungarian, and my father's parents were Slovakian. They both immigrated here shortly after World War II. They moved to New Jersey and took jobs, both of them as longshoremen. My parents were born in New Jersey. They met in high school and were married shortly after graduating. My father was a traveling salesman, and we moved around a lot. I can remember that it was hard for me because we would move and I would finally be making some new friends and then we'd have to move again. I would hate, hate it when I had to start the whole process over and over again each time that we moved. It's not like today where kids can make friends, move away, but still be able to communicate with one another. You can still talk to your buddies through silly apps or while playing video games online. Our lifestyle that we had caused me to be a bit of a loner. Honestly, my best friend was probably my little brother, Peter. Now, he's five years younger than me and was my constant companion throughout most of my childhood. Me and Peter, we shared a bedroom. And at one time, we lived in an old, small house in a town called Warren, in Ohio. I don't remember the exact address or the exact neighborhood, but it looked pretty normal to me from what I can remember. Like I said, this was a typical week night, nothing out of the ordinary. Me and my brother were sent to bed by my mother probably around 9.30 or so because we had school in the morning. It was just my mother, my brother, and me at home this particular evening. My father 
was out of town working, what which was pretty common. Anyways, we were lying in our separate beds, but in the same bedroom, trying to sleep. At some point, my brother had fallen asleep, but I could not. I could still hear my mother watching television from the other room. After a while, I could hear my mother get up. I heard her turn the TV off, and I heard her go to her bedroom. Now remember, this was an old house, so I could hear the boards creaking when people walked around, so I could hear her walk out of the living room and walk into her bedroom. Now this is the part of the night that for some reason I always hated the most. When it's dead quiet, it's dark, it's quiet, and everyone in the house is asleep but me. I absolutely hated that part whenever it would happen. Hell, I still hate it when it happens to me today. I always tried to fall asleep before everyone else in the house because I hated that feeling. I don't know where this feeling came from, but it just always happened. On some nights, it's like the more I thought about it, the worse it would get. I simply could not fall asleep. I don't know why I've always had this fear. I mean, I do now, but not back then. Anyway, at some point that evening, while lying awake in my bed, I began to hear this very faint, high-pitched whining sound. Something very low. The only way I could describe it is if you're a photographer and you charge your batteries in a charger, sometimes when it's in the wall, you can hear a slight sound. The more I listened, it felt like it was getting louder and louder. Ear piercing. Now, remember, the volume wasn't that loud, but it still felt like somebody was sticking a pin into my eardrum. Suddenly, I noticed something moving in one of the dark corners of my bedroom. Now, naturally, at first, I thought, ah, oh, it's just my little brother, Peter. He's messing around with me or probably looking around for one of his toys or something. But when I looked to my left, where my brother's bed was, he was still in it sound asleep. Now this is where I started to panic. My heart began beating louder and louder. What the hell is in my room? I tried to focus on whatever this thing was, and that's when it stepped forward out of the darkness. What I saw was a shadowy looking figure standing about, I would have to guess, seven feet tall. It had on an overcoat or a cloak or something. It was not wearing a hat, but it was staring at me with a devilish-looking grin. This thing appeared to be male, with pale, grayish-looking skin. It did not speak, but it was moving closer towards my bed, but very slowly. What's weird is I don't remember it walking. It was like it was floating or gliding towards me. Not walking. Definitely not walking. Well, I wasn't waiting any longer. At this point, I jumped out of my bed. I ran across the room, threw the door open, and ran into my mother's room screaming that there was a man in our bedroom. My mother, obviously half asleep and panicked, grabbed the shotgun by her bed and ran into our bedroom in order to save my brother. Oh yeah, I left him behind. Sorry, bro but I had to get out of there. Anyways, my mother flew into the room, turned the lights on, and there was nothing. There was no one there by my brother. There was no one there. My brother, by the way, was still asleep. He was only now coming too, with the lights being on and us talking. My mother inspected their bedroom. She looked in the closets. Hell, she searched the rest of the house and found nothing. No windows were broken. No screens were cut. All the windows were locked and in their place. She checked the doors and they were locked too. She asked me again what I saw and I told her everything. Everything that I could remember. She told me that it was a nightmare and not to worry and that these things happen from time to time. Well, needless to say, me and my brother crawled into her bed that night and we slept there till morning. Now, I didn't see him, meaning the pale-faced, shadowy figure, for a few years. This time, we moved again, this time to Lawrence, Kansas. I was about 13 years old now. 
Same sort of thing as last time. Same basic scenario, with only a few differences. My father once again was out of town working. Me, my brother, and my mom were at home. Once again, it was a school night. And once again, it was time for bed. Now it's around 10.30 this time. I guess I got to stay up a little later now that I was older. But anyways, in this house, me and my brother actually had separate bedrooms. It was one of the rare times that that happened. So we were really stoked and excited about it. So this time, I was alone in my bedroom. I actually fell asleep just fine. But something woke me up around 3.30 a.m. And I just had this strange feeling. I felt like someone was watching me. I thought maybe my brother was in the room and had asked me a question, and that's what woke me up. But I didn't see anybody there. I immediately thought that maybe that strange man I saw one time that I saw in my bedroom years earlier, perhaps it was him that was there. I scanned the room, but I didn't see anything. I still, no matter what I did, had this feeling of dread. And my image of the man in the bedroom, believe me, was seared into my memory. I thought about him a lot. I also dreamt about him a lot. And I didn't know why. In my dreams, he was always chasing me, trying to get me. I felt like he wanted to hurt me. But I would always wake up before he could get there. As I lay there in my bed on this particular evening, trying as hard as I could not to think of him, I began to hear that same ear-piercing whine I heard the first time. It kept getting louder and louder. So much so, I felt like my ears were going to pop. I, it physically hurt, like I had swimmer's ear or bad ear infection. I sat up and I looked around, and when I panned my view from left to right, he was there. The same dark, shadowy-looking figure standing around seven feet tall. He was only standing three feet from me. This time, I got a much better look at him. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe. I don't think he was causing this. I just think I was so terrified that I couldn't catch my breath. I couldn't believe I was seeing the same figure again, five or so years later. His face because I was so close this time, was grotesque. It was gray, leathery. He gave me a grin, like he enjoyed my fear. He enjoyed my suffering. He put his right pointer finger up to his mouth, indicating that he wanted me to be quiet. But I was like, no way. I finally was able to scream, and I screamed and screamed and screamed uncontrollably. When I did, he instantly vanished. My brother and my mother come storming into my bedroom, turned on the lights and tried to figure out what was happening to me. Why was I screaming? Why was I so frantic in the middle of the night? There was no one in the room. Nothing. But they could tell. Something had affected me. I was soaked in sweat. I was literally shaking. I couldn't put sentences together. I had wet my bed. My mother just tried to console me. She knew something was wrong. She knew something was up. She ran a shower for me. And again, after that, I spent the remainder of the night in her room, in her bed. The next day, I guess after giving me some time, she asked me what happened. And this time, she had an old school tape recorder. She wanted to record my story so that she could play it back when my father returned in a week or so. At least that's what she told me. Turns out later behind my back, she played it for a psychiatrist that she had hired secretly. I later met with her, who asked me more about these encounters. I told the psychiatrist about my sightings, about the numerous dreams I had had about the strange shadow man. I told her everything. I explained that I had nightmares all of the time about him, whoever he was, but that I also had real encounters while I was fully awake. My mother had feared by this time that I had lost my mind or something. Perhaps I was bipolar. I was examined several times by many different doctors. They even did a brain scan to see if I had a tumor or something. 
Each time they came back negative. I was completely fine, completely healthy. I could tell my mom believed me. My dad, on the other hand, was a typical father, like the fat, like a typical fashion father of those days. He thought I was full of shit and that I was making it all up to get attention. We moved again, this time to a small town called Branchville in South Carolina. I was 17 now, and I was in high school. I had seen this shadow man numerous times by now. I would dream about him a lot, and I would generally see him two to three times a year, and always in my bedroom. I didn't know how to make it stop. I tried lots of things. I read the Bible. I would say prayers even before I went to bed. I would burn sage. Everything that I could think of. But nothing stopped these reoccurring dreams and the dread of seeing him again. This really had an effect on me. I couldn't concentrate on homework, and my grades suffered. I had little to no friends. I generally think now that I was depressed. One day, when I got home from school, my mother sat me and my brother down in the living room and told us that our grandfather had passed away. Now, this was her father and that we would be traveling to New Jersey for the funeral and help clean out his home. You see, my grandmother had died four years earlier due to pancreatic cancer. I wasn't very close to my grandparents because we were always moving around the country. Me and my brother did spend a few summers at their house while growing up, but I never had any sightings of the shadow man while I was there. Now remember, my grandparents were immigrants. They were from Hungary. They spoke English but still had very strong accents. I can remember hearing them speak Magyar, which is the official language of Hungary. They always prepared strange foods and had strange traditions whenever I was around them. My mother would try to explain what they were and why they did them. So, every time I went through their house, I was always a little interested in what my grandparents were up to. I wish I could have spent more time with them, but anyways, a few weeks later, we did that. We drove up to New Jersey for the funeral and things. And when the thing was over, we went eventually to my grandfather's house to clean it out because they were going to sell the property. My mother had a sister named Zora, and she was there too. It took us about four or five days to clean out the house, keep what we wanted, and sell the rest in an estate sale. On the very last day, while cleaning out the attic, I found a bunch of old leather-backed journals. There were five in all, and I began looking through the first one. Not much of any interest. It just looked like a bunch of chicken scratch. It was poor penmanship for sure, and it was in Hungarian, which I couldn't read or speak. So I put it down, and the next one pretty much was more of the same. It was the third one, though. That one grabbed my attention. Around a third of the way into the third journal, there were some hand-drawn pictures my heart stopped. I dropped the journal, and I stood there in disbelief. I couldn't believe what I just saw. I picked the journal back up, and there, in my grandfather's old journal, were not one, but dozens of hand-drawn drawings of the same exact shadow being that had been terrorizing me my entire life. In, ad in addition to these super creepy drawings were all of these notations and paragraphs written in Magyar. I looked in the other journals, but they were just normal stuff. But this one journal was unmistakably talking about the shadow man, only I couldn't read what it was saying. Was my grandfather visited by the same entity? What did it want? Why would it follow both of us? Now I really wished I could speak with him. I flew down the stairs the drop stairs from the attic, yelling and calling my mother to come and take a look at what I had found. I showed my mother, and she looked pale and really white all over, like the color just drained from her face. I said, look, Grandpa saw it too. Grandpa saw it too. The shadow man. The shadow man. I was showing it to everyone there. Now, at this point, my aunt, my brother, and a few other friends and family were gathering around to find out what all the commotion was about. I showed him this, and what has been following me around my entire life. He must have seen it too. I asked my mother and aunt, what did it say? Please translate it for me. They looked over it, but wouldn't tell me what it said. They said that 
What was written didn't make any sense. Something about a devil, a pact, a wrongdoing of some kind, a family legacy. My mother took it home and said she would read over it when she had more time. A few days later, she said that she had finished the journal and that there were some things that me and my brother needed to know. So we were like, okay, please tell us. She said that in the journal, my grandfather, her father, spoke about his older deceased brother named Elek, Elek Horvath. Now my mother's maiden name was Horvath. And according to the journal, somewhere in the old country, my grandfather and his family lived on a farm and his older brother had gotten into a serious fight with another boy on a nearby farm over a girl in the area. I guess they were both courting the same woman. Well, a fight ensued, and my grandfather's brother, Elek, killed the other boy. When the boy's father found out what had happened, he went and procured someone they knew, a gypsy, to place a curse or hex on the Horvath family, one that would only affect the males of that family. Now, how my grandfather knew all of this, I didn't know never will know. But now it all makes sense to me. My mother said that when I was very young, more than once my grandfather would ask her to leave me alone or if she ever left me alone in my room at night and also questioned her more than once if I had ever been visited by the boogeyman. Now this of course was before my first encounter when I was eight. My mother had completely forgotten about it until she read the journals. She said that when it originally happened, she just thought her dad was messing around, just teasing her. But now it all makes sense. This curse was placed on our family and has been passed down from my grandfather to me because I'm a male. My grandfather only had two daughters and neither one of them ever had any strange encounters. I asked my brother, but he denies any visitations. So why only me? What does the shadow man want? How do I get rid of him? How do I end this curse? Can you even do that? Do I have to worry about having a son in the future and it following him around? Sadly, I've continued to dream about him and I've seen him on about eight occasions since the discovery of that book. I've since read a lot about curses and about shadow beings, the hat man and others, but I have no answers. I just wanted to share this story with you and your listeners if they are suffering from something similar or some similar visitations, perhaps it too is a curse from years gone by. Thanks for the incredible show. Stan. Dude, that's terrifying. So I don't know why, but just thinking of a curse being placed on you in the old country, I'm thinking of like, you know, Transylvania. Yeah. Something like that. I think it's because also he's the oldest of the two. Well, he's the first born. Well, he did mention that his brother has never come forward with any sightings of it at all. And he may not. I mean, it may only be, you know, it's like you, it's talked about as it's passed on mother to daughter, father to son. This was the grandfather had no sons. So it became the firstborn male. And that may be what it is. I'd be curious to know if his grandfather had any other like males in his family that had ever experienced it. Like, Maybe not direct, but maybe he had an uncle or maybe he's got a cousin somewhere that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that'd be interesting to know because he, his grandfather didn't do the killing. Yeah. His older brother did. Yes. But it appears that the curse was on all of the males in the family. It's the way it seems. And I don't know why I've heard of other tales similar to this where for whatever reason, they like always go after the males. Yeah. But that's not what you remember. Shandon shares the story that her mother, remember it had followed her. They had seen it ever since they had left up there. So it's not, there's always outliers, but it does seem like there's more guys that get stuck with something like this. Probably it has to do with that time. Like that time in the world. Men were more nefarious. Unfortunately, like men had all the power. You know what I mean? Like back then, if you were a woman, your job was to raise the children and and the men were the ones that owned all the businesses and everything. So it would hurt your family worse if I punished the men. Yes. I would I would only assume that that's why it was done that way. Yeah. I agree. Cool I've, story. Look, I've got one here I have to share with you. And this is one of those. I got to pull this up. Y'all are, 
this is another one of those things. This one's going to be, I don't even know that she actually gives her name, but this is a woman that sent this in. Oh, I forgot. Yep. Her name is Dawn. Dawn, thanks for sending this in. She wrote a thing about here called The Ghost That Saved Me is what it was. She says, let me start off by saying, I love your show, and it's because of how welcoming and open you two are about these subjects that gives me the nerve to share this experience. I've tried a few times, but people always end up judging you, so I stopped sharing this a long time ago. And which we get that often, you know, and we've discussed it too. You kind of got to be open-minded. You really have to be accepting of so people will talk about their stories because they don't have any questions why would you make all this stuff up now when i tell you this you're going to enjoy this says you can call me dawn and i grew up in utah and had a completely normal childhood and in the summers my sister and i would go visit my mom's only sister who lived in wyoming my aunt was a widow she was young when her husband passed in an auto accident one winter and she had never remarried And she was the fun aunt. She had barns and animals and horses, and it was a blast. And it was beautiful there, and we loved it. Now, she didn't live too far from the Wind Wind River Reservation. That's exactly right for those. It's just like the movie there in Wyoming. It's the Wind River that they did the movie on. It goes on to say that she had several Native friends that lived there. And that these women would get together and they would do crafts or play cards or pretty much anything just so they could all hang out and all his kids would run and play. Now, my aunt was a lot like the ants from the movie Practical Magic. <laughs> so very eccentric. Says So one afternoon, some of us kids slipped off to go for a hike. And I was 13 at the time. My sister, I was 11. We hadn't been gone very long when we all split up, taking different trails, but they all led to the same small hill that looked down into a dark valley. Now, we all met at the top of the hill and decided then and there that today was the day that we went down and checked out the dark timber at the bottom. So being next to the oldest, one of the boys was 14, but was about to be 15. I might have had a crush on him, she says, which was one of the reasons I even went along with this. They were five of us all together, twin 10-year-olds, a boy and a girl, the older boy's siblings, my sister that was 11, her friend, another girl who had just turned 11, and then me, and of course, you know, they goes on to talk about the older boy. So there's a whole group of them, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, this whole thing, this, she's talking about this whole bravery deal, and I'm looking here, there was actually six of them. So anyway, listen, so all with all of our bravery, we went down into the timber, and it was further than I thought it would be. But we got there, and my legs were burning. So jokingly, I said, I hope I can climb up out of here. And everyone laughed nervously. Now, we spent a couple of hours talking and creeping around looking, and I think we were expecting to see something, but didn't really believe we would, if that makes any sense. And anyhow, after a few hours, Thomas, the older boy, said we'd better go or we'll get stuck down here in the dark. And it was like it was on cue. It felt like nightfall started moving faster. We'd been messing around so much that we didn't pay attention to how far we've actually moved into the timber. So we kind of panicked trying to get back to the tree line and start up the hill. And my sister and her friends squealed a little bit. And that's when it all began. With that sound, something came alive in that dark timber. You could feel the entire environment change in an instant. You couldn't hear any sounds of wildlife, only the wind and our heartbeats and this thing. We all felt and heard it at once, and we broke into a run to get out of the trees. I don't know if it was my sister's friend or if it was one of the twins that saw it first, but when they screamed, it was something unreal. I'll never forget the fear and terror in that voice. I'm an RN in the ER, and I've heard some terrible cries, but nothing comes close to the sound like the one that those kids let out. I turned to look myself at, of course, reaction more than anything else, and I saw this creature, for the lack of a better term. 
Its arms and legs were longer than normal, but not ab- not super long. The skin covering them looked like land striders from the dark crystal. That's that thing. It looks like they got like, what is it, like uh, crutches, like for legs and, and yeah. arms. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I haven't seen that movie in a while. Yeah. Says it was still man-sized, though, but I couldn't make out its eyes because it had what looked like burlap wrapped around its body and like a hood over its face. But I could see this huge jaw and it was offset like it had been broken and reset extremely crooked. It was also making this deep breathing rough sound mixed with a type of joy or happiness sound like it was enjoying this and it was enjoying the fear and the race. I screamed But it was very meek as I was about to faint from this fear. I looked for my sister and I ran to her as we all ran for the bottom of the hill. When we made it and of course started up, I could feel myself getting weaker and weaker as my legs pumped. Everyone clicked up in groups, the twins together, Thomas and my sister, my sister's friend, and my sister and I. And we all scattered in our groups as we ran up the hill. So that makes sense. They all just kind of parted out. I'm not picturing like a super steep hill. I'm picturing like a big rolling hill coming up out of here. Right. Yeah, you that's know, not, not picture. Got, yeah. Well, there's trails up it, but I mean, like it's work to get up it. Goes on to say, it wasn't by design, but more it just happened. But whichever it was, the creature chose us. I don't know if it was because we were the only non-native children or because maybe we were easier to see in the evening hours, or what, but that thing was coming up after us. We had cut around the edge of the hill a little bit, trying to find a less steep area to run and to get up over the top to the trails that led down to the house. Now here's the part of the story where I lose most people, and I swear on my life this is what happened next. We pushed around a little bush or brush onto a game trail, with this thing coming up the hill behind us. And there on the trail was a beautiful native man. He looked as stoic as the old black and white photos you see in history books. He didn't look much older than maybe 18, and he was dressed like he fell out of the 1800s. He waved us past in a frantic manner, which only pushed us harder. And as we passed, I thought I felt him touch me on the back, but I didn't look back until we had made it to the top. When we made it to the top and not more than 40 yards from the native man, we heard what I'm guessing is the creature make a funny roaring sound and then all was normal again. It wasn't chasing us. There was no native man and even that awful feeling of terror was gone. We rushed back to the house and we all met up back there and we sat outside for a good bit, shaken up and trying to wrap our heads around what had just happened. Nobody else had seen the man but my sister and I, but they all agreed that this thing was a skinwalker and that this man, or whatever this was, was a shaman. Now, Thomas goes on to say that given the history of Wind River, that seeing the spirits of the braves that fought to protect and defend themselves and their families in these areas were not uncommon. One thing that's always stood out to me is how accepting my native friends were of this. That evening, I was terrified, and so was my sister, but the twins were almost matter-of-fact about it, and even at their age, acted like it was a dog that had chased them. We never talked about it amongst ourselves after that, and we still hung out after it, but we never went back into the dark timber at the bottom of that hill, and I guess one of them had told my aunt, or one of their friends, because my aunt laughed one day and asked me, about the skinwalker we had seen and if I wanted to talk about it. Now, this was a couple of years later, and I told her what happened, and she said that she had also seen some strange things from time to time, but nothing like that, and that she knew it wouldn't be bothering us ever again. I don't know what she knew or what she really meant by that, but nothing strange has ever happened to me or my sister since that day. We like to call it our bad luck birthday, because we feel like we outgrew bad luck that day. Now, my aunt has since sold her place and moved closer to town, and I haven't talked to Thomas in a year or so, but I think I'll call him after this 
and see what he still remembers or his siblings about that day. Thanks for all the great shows, guy. Guys, I hope I wasn't too boring with this forever listener, Don. Wow. I love the stories of skinwalkers. And what is it? This ghostly native shaman was there. Like he knew, like he was protecting them. And I like how Don points out the fact that maybe this thing did get after them because they were the only whites there, the only non-natives right. that was with the group. That makes sense to me. As it was coming for them, and then whatever this this dude was has saved them. That's- Could you imagine seeing a land strider chasing you? What is up with the burlap? So it makes it sound, is it a jacket? What the heck's it wearing? Yeah, you know, this is often described in in lots of strange sightings, whether it's extraterrestrial, whether it's cryptid or whatever. Like, people see strange-looking outfits that yes. just don't make any sense, like the, the shadow being that was seen. He said it looked like the thing was wearing an overcoat or yeah, a, cloak. Right. a cloak. Now, why would an entity, a demonic entity, need clothing? Yeah, it wouldn't. Right? It makes no sense. Would never need it. I don't know. I'm, I want to share one more with you. Okay. This one is... We've gotten tons of stories over all the years. And every now and again, you get one that pops out that what you think is going to happen isn't at all what it turns out to be. And this was one of them. And I really, really love this story. It says, hey, fellas, love the show. And my daughter and I love to listen together and discuss the topics. My name is Dave, and I wanted to share this with y'all. It's different, so I hope you don't mind. Now, I lived and grew up in western Pennsylvania. And this is where this all took place. Now, Dave's not my real name. And I don't want to say the town in case, well, you'll see after the story. So right out of high school, I was a typical bum. I didn't have a direction or a purpose except chasing girls and drinking beer. A friend's uncle got me a job as a security guard on a night shift looking after an old factory building in a big industrial area. Mm. This is the early 2000s and I had just turned 19. My office was this little job site trailer. And it once was, uh, there was a a big delivery lot behind this big warehouse. And my main job was to keep whoever or whatever from breaking in and squatting or stealing anything. And of course, the best way to do that was to just randomly take a stroll with a flashlight and make your presence known. Now, we couldn't carry guns, so I had a can of pepper spray and a radio. Really nothing if any real trouble had gone down. And of course, at this time, I'm five foot 10 and 150 pounds fully dressed. So I'm not imposing at all. And I had made my mind up that I wasn't getting so much as a scratch defending this place from anyone or anything. I wanted a paycheck and a party. So one evening during my nightly strolls, I noticed what looked like a fire flickering across the way behind another one of the old buildings. Now being nosy, I slipped through the fence surrounding my job site crossed this brushy concrete drainage area and popped up right behind an old cab over camper sitting on the ground behind this huge factory building. It was out of sight, and my guess is it had been there a few years, but there was an older fella living there. I had never seen the fire before or had even heard of anyone seeing this guy. But when I walked out of the dark and introduced myself, I scared this poor old guy almost to death. And he hopped up and started nervously gathering his stuff and kind of moving backwards. I quickly explained who I was and that I was what I was doing and that I was just bored and nosy. Well, after that, he relaxed and we hit it off almost instantly. This dude was so charismatic and had such a smooth and engaging voice. I could have listened to him for hours. And in fact, I eventually did. He said to call him Chip, and then he offered me a beer, and of course, I took it. When I say homeless, I don't mean dirty and filthy or drunk or mentally ill or suffering or anything like that. Chip was clean. He had a camp shower hanging. He had all of his stuff hung up, and Chip didn't smell, and he was also very well-spoken. I remember being embarrassed at all the stuff I didn't know, but this old homeless guy did. They even, or that even, began a friendship that lasted almost three months. See, I'd get to work in the evenings and do my rounds, and then I'd head over to see Chip. And we'd sit around and just talk. And that's exactly what I needed. My mom and dad were divorced, and my dad never wanted kids. 
So I never really had a guy in my life to teach me guy stuff. So I felt like like less of a man when all my friends talked about stuff they'd do. But Chip seemed to almost know this, and so he started to share with me this knowledge that I was needing. He also convinced me that I was better than this security job, and that I need to find something and educate myself in it. That life can take away everything you have, but it can't take your education. We would drink beer, but never more than three. He always had a six-pack, and we split it. No more was allowed. And I loved going to see him, and it made my job great. And after about three months, in comes one of my coworkers one evening and said that the company was about to start work and that there were going to be a lot more people around and that we would have company in and out all around us all the time and that they were also trying to buy the land in the building where Chip was staying. So after finding out all of this and knowing that the big change was coming, I headed right over there that evening to tell him the news. And I said, hey, the company I work for is trying to buy this land that you're on and that I'd gladly help him find a place to stay and I'd help any way I could. And he just calmly laughed, said it wasn't necessary, and it was probably time he moved on anyhow. I only got to see him a couple more times that week and the trucks came in on my side, so I had to work, of course, a little bit more and my shift changed a bit. And for the next couple of weeks, this is how it was until we got told that the company had bought the property and we'd be moving over there and working next. Well, I was super excited now because I could hang with Chip and I was going to get him a job, if I could, working with me since he was already there. Well, the evening before we were set to have our trailer moved over to that next spot, I slipped over there to tell him the news. Chip was gone. The camper was there, but nothing else. His clothes and things were gone. And all that was left was a six-pack of beer and a note that said thanks. I wanted to cry, man. For the first time in my life, I'd felt like I'd had a real father figure, and now he was gone. And I didn't get a chance to tell him how much he really meant to me. Well, it wasn't long, maybe a week after that, that I put in my notice, and I went back to school, and I started studying, and I started studying engineering. I had gotten interested talking to Chip about the old buildings in the area. So life goes on and I graduated and I got a job and with a funny enough, the company that I had worked security for. So time passes and I met a girl and we got together and we started a family and everything's great, but I always wondered about Chip. So one day out of curiosity, I started looking through some old paperwork from when the company bought the building and the land. And after about an hour, I came across some pictures of the building walked through prior to the purchase and with the previous owner. I almost fell out of my chair. Standing there with the company's inspectors and engineers was Chip, wearing a suit, clean shaven, hair trimmed, but there he was. Something I didn't add was Chip was missing part of his earlobe. I never asked how it happened, but it was noticeable, and the guy in the pick had the very same injury. I could never find what happened to Chip. After that day, and I'm not sure that's even his real name, but the man was worth millions. And who knows why he chose to live that way, for how long he was there, or where he went after he sold that place. But one thing is for certain, I owe all I am today to that man. He listened to me. He never talked down to me or made me feel like lesser, for not knowing something, and he taught me that I can make a difference and accomplish things. The only thing holding me back is me. I know this isn't scary or creepy, but I felt like I should share this, and I hope Chip found whatever it is he was looking for. Thanks for reading. Hope you and your family have a great Christmas. Your friend, Dave. Wow, it's like a undercover boss. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Hanging out on the low low, just knocking back some suds. He had no idea the guy was a millionaire. It makes you wonder, like, was he just down there just because? Because the way Dave described it, the dude's been living there for quite some time. Well, as crazy as it sounds, I've read about more than one super successful person that after they got all their success, actually preferred it when they didn't have any money. Like They thought life was simpler. Like, I even met a guy. I, I did his house, and he was well off. I mean, he owned, like, a pretty big company. And he said that 
you know, he's blessed and he's happy. And of course, he loved his businesses and his and his houses. He had multiple houses, like one here, one in Colorado, one in Florida. You know, the guy was very successful. But he said, you know what? The happiest time for him is when it was him and his wife and his three kids, and they all lived in like a tiny 1,200 square foot house. Like he's like, we didn't have much money. But to him, that was his best memories. He's like, now all my kids are gone. They're yeah. all married off. I can buy whatever I want. You think that that's what you makes a meaningful life, and it turns out it's just not. Turns out, yeah. Maybe this guy wasn't even real. Maybe this guy was like a guardian angel. Yeah, maybe it was. But but what's he doing in the picture? Like the people, it, that's what's so crazy about that story. When I first read it, I'm like, dude, I have so many questions. Now I understand Dave can't share a lot of them because he doesn't want to get the ball yeah. rolling, you know, yeah, and the sure. whole thing. That's where he leaves it. But still, that's wild. That's, that's real. It's a great story. Yeah. Let's take a break. And when we get back from the break, we'll wrap the show up. You are listening to Expanded Perspectives. back with expanded perspectives <laughs> man it's uh, glad to be back fantastic stories i have to say fantastic stories it just goes to show you it's the sharing of stories it's a sharing of knowledge it doesn't have to be paranormal no no it's a great story um if you yeah. people have not let us down y'all have been killing it with the stories and stuff sent in here lately i agree and and let's keep it going we are still trying to put together a book and things yep, like that yep. and so we need your stories uh, send them in. Like I said, you can email the show, expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. Try to be as thorough as you can. You know, the longer, the more in depth, the more critical you can be in yeah. that story and the way its story is told, it, the better. And if you don't feel like writing it down, we do have a hotline. You can call the show 888 393 2783. Like I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, since the, we've been on break for a couple of weeks, a lot of people have been calling in. We had an interesting woman call in named Brianna. And she had a rather strange sighting on a dark and lonely night somewhere in Idaho. Let's give that a listen. Hello, this is Brianna Woods. Um, you can share my name and my story on your podcast. I've been listening for about six months, and I've been loving every second of it. You guys are awesome. So <clears throat> this story takes place in um, Middleton, Idaho, uh, where I was living at the time. And I was in the car with my girlfriend. And we were taking her brother out to go get his check from his boss in the rural country. And um, we were out there and he had been doing some, he had been getting his check and talking to his boss and he took about two hours to do this. And so it was nighttime, it was about eight o'clock. Um, it was dark outside, really dark. You could see the moon, all the stars and everything. And we picked, we picked her brother up, or he got in the car, and we made our way onto the freeway. Um, as we were in the car during those two hours, and as it was getting dark outside, I had noticed these sphere-like lights in the sky that had just kind of been zigzagging around. And at first, I sort of just was like pointing them out to my girlfriend when she was next to me, and she saw them too. She didn't really think much of them because she she doesn't really care as much about you know conspiracies and fun things like that and so I was really I was really curious as to what was going on outside and so I had been I had my eyes on the skies and for a lot of a lot of the two hours I was pretty much looking out the window and trying to figure out what was going on and as we made our way onto the freeway and left the house I had noticed these two lights above the freeway and at first when we were coming up on them about a mile away from them, I thought they were like these light poles. Um, 
But as we got closer, I realized that there was no other light poles on the freeway, and that they, these were I, like just alone, like in the sky. And so, as we get closer, I realized that one of them starts banking to the right, kind of slowly, and then um, just jumps up right back to where the other one was. And so I pulled my phone out, and I'm videotaping through uh, the front window of the car, the window shield. And so I do have a video of these objects. They couldn't have been more than half a mile above us. Um, I honestly, I don't know what, how big they were. Uh, if I had to guess, they were each like five feet, five feet diameter. Um, but the video does not do this justice. So they were like these triangular shapes and it was almost like this round pole coming out from behind them. And on the end of the pole, it was like this metallic spear shaped object. It was the weirdest thing. And after this night, I got home and I Googled online and I Googled drones or just models of drones or mini airplanes or, um, and I, I couldn't find anything like them. I drew a picture up of the, what I saw, these, what they looked like in real life. And it's just, it's incredible. And I haven't seen anything like it since, but that was a, it was a really weird night. And as soon as we passed them on the freeway um, and we went underneath them, um, I looked behind the car and both of the lights were gone, both of the objects. And so that was also very weird. Um, thank you for listening to my long and confusing story. Um, love your podcast. Uh, so, bye. And we're back. Crazy. Floating Spears. I think you did a whole episode. Yes. On these spheres, and what makes it so interesting to me, not that all your stories aren't interesting, is uh, recently, I mean, within just the last week, the Pentagon released some more photos of what appeared to be USOs or UFOs coming out of the water, hovering, uh, climbing to like 80,000 feet, and just, it's wild. It's like, why are these stories coming out now? Why is Bob Lazar sitting down and telling his story now? Why is... It just seems like a, like we always joked about it for years that the UFO stories was kind of dead other yeah, than just like yeah. random sightings. It wasn't that good. It was like the heyday of UFO sightings kind of ended, I don't know, by the 1980s. Yeah. And now it seems like for whatever reason, it's, it's starting to happen again. And it's not mainstream as it should be. That's what I've talked about before. You yeah. would think that um, this is should be one of the top stories on every news outlet, that like there are- showing what appears to be crafts from another world, another dimension. They don't appear to be anything I'm pretty about us. I don't I don't believe Russia or China or anybody has this technology. Otherwise, why would they hide it? They just yeah. fly it over and say, look, we're here. Well, look what we got. You don't. Exactly. But then, then that begs the question, what are they? Who are they? And why are they here? Yeah. What do they want? If they're friendly, why would they just come say hello? I, yeah, but I mean, you and I was discussing. You don't stop and talk to an ant mound when you walk by. I do either. talk to ant mounds just because of that. You now. would, you would. <laughs> Anyways, I God, like I the stories. Keep sending them in. Very cool. Um, I know the that Christmas is about to be here. New Year's is about yep. to be here. Uh, thank God, twenty twenty is about to be over. <sighs> even though I imagine that early parts, at least of twenty twenty one, are going to be the same. But uh, we're all in this together. That's true. Um, I know a lot of people like to start with a workout program or something like that when the new year comes new around. New year, new me. Right? It Just always stop. happens. Just stop. I see the commercials on TV already ramping up for, you know, you're supposed to buy your wife a Lexus. New year, same me. Or there's some kind of jewelry. He went to Jared and <laughs> stuff. I mean, I get, there's never anything for dad except for like, like you've talked about tools. tools. Yep. Why is that? Cooking. Or, or building. That's that's our use. Yeah. It's annoying. You know what dad gets? Stuck with the bill. That's what dad gets. <laughs> right? So uh, are you going out of town or anything for the holidays? No, we're not, we're not doing... Uh, we're going to actually have... Well, because we can't see all the everybody else, it'll just be a small group of us the week before Christmas, and then we'll have Christmas here, and then that'll probably be that. Yeah, we're not traveling out of state or anything either. And because of coronavirus, um, you know, parties are are limited in size. Uh, I know that one of my wife's aunts is pretty sick already, so 
she's not been able to go to anything. Yeah. And it's really sad because she may not even be around for the next holiday season. Yeah. Like kind of missing your last one because of the stupid virus. That's what I'm worried about my mother-in-law is this may be the last, the last one that, and she's not going to get to be here because of what's going down. So yeah, we're hoping not, but you got to kind of prepare. We look at it as tragic, but for all we know, moving on is better. Yeah, that's true. Right. So you don't know. So maybe staying here is worse. Maybe we should be jealous. Maybe we're (laughs) like, dang, dang. Maybe, but that's about all the time we have for this show, folks. Uh, We promise we'll be back next week. Oh, I'm going to have some more videos. I got some more videos that I'm going to be dropping next week, surprisingly. So, Oh, is this that new um, <laughs> new programming you're talking about? I was talking about something fun. I hope y'all enjoyed. I'm tossed up on the names. I'm not really sure. Uh, I like so. some of the names you ran by me. I, I really did. I okay. thought some of them are pretty good. I've got two of them I'm going to bounce by you, but keep your eyes open. You can keep Look, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you turn on the notifications so you can get it. If you're listening on uh, uh, on any podcast or podcatcher, make sure you subscribe on YouTube to get some of these extra uh, videos, and then we're going to have... I might have tons of elite shows to get to come out with. So I, I got time to record. I got all, I, I got You're time to do You're a full-time podcaster, kinds. baby. Pretty much. Yep, that's what goes down now. Uh, before we get out of here, if you have HBO Max, there's a pretty interesting documentary that just dropped about D.B. Cooper. Yep, I saw it. Thought it was pretty cool. I don't yep. think he went in as in-depth as we had on, on our show, but no. uh, it was really cool. And uh, it seems like there's a resurgence in that, too. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty awesome. I do. So, yep. Very cool. Till next time, folks, stay out of trouble. Wear that mask. Wash your hands six feet apart. Please. I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all. Uh-huh.